I'm looking forward to being with you this morning. Uh, if I can get everything set up here. White pages versus yellow pages. So the reason for the, the title of our meeting this morning is based on something that dates me just a little bit. Um, a lot of you in here may not even understand or know how to work this, what these are. Back in the age before the internet, which is, again, a, a eons ago, there were these books circulated. And in those books were listings of phone numbers. When you wanted to know someone's phone number, you could not Google it. You literally had to go to this massive book. And number one, make sure the book was in the neighborhood you were looking for, right? Make sure it had that neighborhood. And then you would go to the phone book and look for the person's phone number. Depending on whether you were looking for a residence or a commercial business, you had two different sections of the phone book. The white pages were the pages where all the people's house numbers were kept, again, before cell phones. And then the yellow pages were the ones where all the businesses and so on were. And so you get these books sitting in your house, normally next to the phone that had a cord on it, if you remember that. And you'd have to search through and sift through that book. It occurred to me years ago that a lot of people, their Bibles kind of take on the same uh, personality. Some of the pages are simply discolored, and some of them are not. This was the Bible of a person who was a dear friend of mine. He was an elderly gentleman in the Chiefland, Florida congregation. The only man I ever met named Hillary. Apparently that was a thing back in the day. His whole family is named Hillary. All the men in the family are named Hillary. But they keep mixing it up. For one person's Hill, one person, this person's name is H.C., first two initials. This was his Bible given to me shortly after he died when we lived in Chiefland. And this gave me the idea for this sort of series. Now, it's obvious from the picture H.C. loved his Bible. He carried this Bible some probably five decades. But what you'll notice is some of the sections are more worn than others, right? You can imagine what section would kind of comprise the last, I don't know, three quarters of the Bible, and more specifically, the gospel section of that. Okay, H.C. was a lover of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What I want to do this week with our meeting is go to those pages that aren't worn out in our Bible. Those pages are valuable. We have beautiful lessons that are there. We are in Acts chapter 2 people. We're in Matthew 5 people. We're in Romans 6. We're, we are all of these passages. But all of this book is inspired. right? All of it written by God's hand. All of it profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and so on, as Paul would tell Timothy. And so that's kind of where this meeting series goes. It's Old Testament studies with New Testament applications. Where I want to take you first is to the foot of Mount Sinai. If you have your Bible, we'll be in Exodus this morning. Chapter 33 is where we want to begin our study. Exodus 33, even though we're more prone to read Exodus 32, Exodus 33 is where I want to begin. And I want to set for you the scene of exactly what's going on here. At the foot of Mount Sinai, the people of Israel find themselves. Of course, not on Mount Sinai. They were given strict instructions to not touch the mountain nor let their animals touch the mountain, and anything that did died. Israel is gathered around the foot of this mountain there uh, south and west of the land of Canaan. Somewhere at the foot of that mountain lie shattered two stone tablets. I've often wondered, whatever happened to the fragments of those tablets? Were they just forgotten? Did they, I don't know. The two tablets on which God had written himself what we would call the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words of the Covenant. The tablets that were written with the very finger of God. This is not a good time for Israel. Israel is in disrepair. They're in disarray. Families have laid to rest thousands of their relatives somewhere in the sand around this mountain. These were not slain in war. They were slain by their fellow Israelites. 
the cause of idolatry. The water that they had to drink was tinged with the flavor of burnt powdered gold. Because Moses had taken the golden calf that they had formed while he was on the mountain and in rage burned it, pounded it to dust, scattered it on the water, and then forced Israel to drink it. But worse than all of this is that God no longer goes with them. God has stated unequivocally that he will take them to the land of promise, or at least he will provide for them going to the land of promise. But he's not going with them anymore. Lest, as he describes, he would destroy them on the way. How different this is from how Israel had started this process when they arrived at Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19 and verse 8, when they had shouted uh, promises of faithfulness to God, Exodus 19 and verse 8, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That was Israel's response to God's offer of a covenant relationship with them. And in just a few short weeks, we find ourselves in chapter 33. It seems that all was lost. It might remind you of the scene of the earth in Genesis chapter 6, where it says that the thought of men's heart was only evil continually. This is another dark moment in human history, more specifically in Israelite history. But just as was true in Genesis 6, there was one who found favor with God, the man Noah. In Exodus 33, there's one Israelite, at least, whose heart is still pure. Exodus 33 and 34 record the intercession Moses makes before God. The one man with a pure heart who would intercede for his people. These two chapters display for us what purity of heart looks like. Of course, we know purity of heart to be one of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What exactly would it mean to have a pure heart? If I find that my heart is impure, what can I do to go about helping the situation? How can I become a person like Moses? To be able to to intercede, to be able to be before God in that circumstance. That's what I want to think with you about for just a few minutes this morning. As much time as I I have, right? We'll we'll see, right? Uh, that's the one thing about this specific one, right? This specific lesson in the gospel meeting, you can't run over because you can't go into the next, you know, that whole thing. Exodus 33, let's follow us, follow along. We're going to look specifically at verse 12. Exodus 33 and verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and I have also found favor, and sorry, rather, you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I may know you, so that I might find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. As Moses begins this process of intercession. He he begins with a a reminder, right, of what God had promised to do, of what God had instructed Moses to do, I mean, many, 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 many months ago before he was ever sent into Egypt to, you know, deal with the plagues and so on. He had told Moses they would bring up the people from the land of Egypt and lead them to the land of promise. And Moses starts his intercession with basically saying, well, this is what you told me to do. You told me to bring up this people, but then he asked sort of a rhetorical question. You have not let me know whom you will send with me. He recognizes that, at least at this stage of the game, he's going by himself. God has already stated, I'm not going with you because the people are wicked and God would destroy them on the way. But after going through all that, he makes an interesting comment. He says, if I found favor in your sight... Let me know your ways that I may know you, that I I may find favor in your sight. 
he says, and this is an interesting sort of way he puts it, if I've found favor, let me know more about you so that I may find favor with you. You might think, well, if he's already got favor, why does he want to know so he can get more favor? But it's that thing in the middle I want to discuss for just a second. Moses wants to know more about God so that he can find favor in the sight of God. And this is something the pure-hearted person does. This is something that if we lack a pure heart or if our purity is not quite where we would want it to be, this is a place where we can get started. The pure-hearted person desires to know more about God. And they go to God for that information. It's true we don't have to go to God to learn everything about God. The fact that we exist in a world and the beauty of it and the complexity of it and the design of it, all those things point to the presence of a creator, a, a being of intelligence and power. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, the creation speaks of the existence and power of God. But the world we live in does not convey everything we need to know about God. It does not convey, for instance, his character. His specific will for our lives. How God feels about us. These are things that if we wish to know more, we have to go to the source. We have to go to God to be able to learn more of God. The pure-hearted person recognizes that if they would be pleasing to their creator, if they would know that there is a creator and two, want to be pleasing to that creator, then they have to go to the creator to find out more. There's a beautiful version of this, I believe, in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah spoke of a time when God's people would come to God seeking knowledge of God. It's a, it, it's a beautiful look forward into the future of who God's people would be whenever they got to the place God wanted them to be. What does God want for his people is kind of what's being described here in Isaiah 2. It says Isaiah 2 and verse 2, it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. It's a look forward at the, at the coming kingdom of Christ. What would be true whenever God's kingdom comes to its fullness? Here's what it will look like, verse 3. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The passage goes on to continue describing this sort of coming kingdom, but notice what Isaiah describes first. The kingdom would be a place where people would come from all nations desiring to know more about God. And that's exactly what they would receive. They would know who God is because they would come to him. And not only that, but verse 3, they would come to God wanting to know more about God so that they could walk in his paths. Kind of like Moses in Exodus 33. He wanted to know more of God so that he could find favor with God. The God followers here come to God so that they can walk in his paths. Those who would develop or demonstrate purity of heart, they're motivated in their search for, for information about God by a desire to serve him. This isn't an academic sort of search. This isn't a trivial pursuit. I want to win all the games of trivial pursuit when theology comes up. The pure-hearted want to know more about God so that they can be pleasing to their God. Think about this. This is Hebrews chapter 8. I know I, I know I said the series is the clean pages, but we're going to be in the New Testament quite a bit, okay? Because the Bible's funny like that. If you talk about the first three quarters of the book, you're going to wind up in the last quarter because that's where a lot of things get answered. Hebrews chapter 8, think about this, verses 10 through 12. Hebrews 8 is quoted from Jeremiah 31. Again, pointing forward to a day when, when a new covenant would be made with, with mankind, not just with the people of Israel, but with all of creation. 
when this new covenant, the Jeremiah 31 covenant that Hebrews 8 describes, notice what's part of this. Verse 8, I'm sorry, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen, everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. It's pointing to the end of this process. Where he says, I'm not going to have to go around telling people you have to. I'm not going to go around telling my people you have to know me. God's people will be the ones who know him. God's people will be spiritual Israel. They will be pure-hearted. They will be seeking information of God from God to please God. They'll all know Him, and they'll all be serving Him. Do you hunger to know more about God? If this is one aspect of having a pure heart, then we have to ask ourselves, do we have it? Do you really want to know more about God? This is more than just filling out my Bible class lesson because my parents make me. I was made to fill out plenty of lessons. Okay, I understand that. This is more than just getting ready to teach because it's my turn to teach. This is more than just I know I'm supposed to, so I think if I have to, I must. This is a desire to know more of God. You want to, not that you have to. Does this describe the way we approach Scripture? We could look personally at our Bible study habits or maybe the lack of them. We could look at our attitude towards group studies. What is my first reaction when I hear that the church is getting together on Wednesday night to study the Bible? Or there's a group meeting in a home somewhere. Is it to find a way out of it, or is it to find a way to get there? Think about this before I move on to the next point. If 95% of your Bible study occurs inside this building, shouldn't it worry you that 98% of your week is spent outside of this building? Right? Right? 98% of your week is spent somewhere else. And if the vast majority of your study is done here, that might point to an issue, to to a lack of a desire to study. Secondly, the pure hearted refuse to go or to continue unless God is happy with them, unless God approves or with God's blessing. Back in Exodus 33, if you're turning back over there, I'll remind you of a passage in Exodus 19 and verse 5. In Exodus 19 and verse 5, God had chosen Israel to be his, quote, own possession among all peoples. However, because of their sin at the mountain, God decides he's not going with them anymore, at least not personally. In Exodus 33, we find that account. 33 and verse 1, the Bible says, Depart, go up from there, you and the people whom you've brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, Amorite, Hittite, Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusite. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, because you are an obstinate people, and I might destroy you on the way. God's going to send an angel to go with them. Now, an angel is a sufficient force to, to conquer all of Israel. Okay, that, that's not, It's not a problem if, if the angel can do it or not. The issue is God sending a, a replacement or God sending someone else to go with them. Because if he goes with them any longer, they're going to do something like they did at Mount Sinai again, and he's going to just wipe them out. Do they still get to go to Canaan? Yeah. They they still get to go as a people to Canaan. They still get the promised land, the milk and honey and all that. So why doesn't Moses just say, cool, we get to go to Canaan still? 
We're sorry we messed up, but hey, at least we still get to go. That's not the type of person Moses is. Go down to verse 14. God responds to verse 14. And he said, My presence shall go with you, and I shall give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us, so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? Now God has already promised that he will take the people of Israel to the land of Canaan and give them Canaan. And Moses says, that's not good enough. That is not going to work. We're not going anywhere, God, unless you go with us. Moses recognized that Canaan without God wasn't worth the journey. Who cared if they had a promised land if they had lost the one who promised it to them? Having a pure heart means refusing to go one step further down life's pathway until our relationship with God is where it needs to be. The pure-hearted person can't tolerate that. What sort of life will we have without God's approval or God's relationship with us? Sure, I mean, eat your needs will be met. God causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. You'll still get the things that you get. You'll still be provided for. The hard-hearted person seeks the good life apart from the God who gives all good things. But such a life is ultimately pointless. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 26, the Bible says, For to a person who's good in his sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, while to the sinner he's given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and striving after the wind. Simply put, a life lived apart from God's approval and God's blessing is just marking the years and the days until you get to meet that God. And then you have the awful responsibility of being able to explain to him why you thought your life not worthy of his service. Are you content to go on living without God's approval? Moses certainly wasn't, but a lot of people are. We could ask this question a number of ways. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus? Have you become a Christian? Or have you decided that you'd rather continue your life separate and apart from God's approval and blessing and salvation? That's, that's really the choice, right? We could ask it a number of different ways. Are you prepared to stand before God in judgment and give an account of why you chose to ignore his efforts to save you? Or perhaps, like Israel, you were once in covenant relationship with God. You were once a Christian, faithfully serving, but now you're not so much anymore. Will the rest of your life, apart from God, be worth an eternity without Him? What good is eternal life without God? The Bible has a word for that called hell. Moses recognized Canaan without God wasn't what he wanted. And that without God's approval, there was no point going forward. Back in Exodus 33, follow me to verse 17. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you've spoken. For you found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. Now, before we press on reading, consider all that Moses has seen to date. Moses was the one who saw God, in, in a sense, in the burning bush, or at least saw a representation of God's glory in the burning bush. Moses was the point man during the plagues against Egypt. He was the one who spread his hands and lifted his staff and threw the dust in the air and 
you know, cast his staff on the ground, it became a snake, and all those, all those incredible, uh, miraculous things. Moses was the man there carrying out those processes. Moses was the one who stretched out his staff over the Red Sea and it parted. He's the one who spoke to the rock. He's the one who saw manna fall from heaven. He's seen so much. And yet in 33 and verse 18, he asks for more. On top of that, think about what God just told him he would do. God will honor the terms of the covenant and bring Israel to the land of promise. God agrees to go with them. You might think, well, we've got it all cleared up, right? We're going to the land of promise and God's going to go with us again. We're kind of back to where we were before we built a golden calf, right? But then he asked for something else. Show me your glory. It's the pure-hearted person that wants to see more of God. They want to see and experience more of God's glory. Now the passage goes on in Exodus 33. He said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Unknowingly, and I'm sure with, with, with good intent, Moses asked for something that would kill him. Not because God is malicious, but because God is God. And his glory in its fullest extent would overwhelm human consciousness and human ability to tolerate just such intensity of presence. It would destroy him. And yet God makes provision in the three verses that follow to see some small glimpse, glimmer of the back of God's glory as he passes by. John spoke of this day, the day when men and women would be able to see God. 1 John chapter 3, and verse 2. Again, looking forward, uh, really even past the, to, to the end re result of the kingdom. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. John says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we'll be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. Now notice verse 3. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So first of all, it's the children of God who one day look forward to their hope of being changed into a form when they would be able to see what Moses requested in Exodus 33. Show me your glory. God's people one day will see the fullness of the glory of God. I cannot, no, none, of us cannot none of us can imagine such a thing. But then John gives us something to do in the meantime. What's our homework? It's to be purifying ourselves as he is pure. The pure-hearted person is actively engaged in becoming more and more and more of a pure person. Purer in speech. Purer in thought, in intent, in action, in relationships. Every aspect of the pure-hearted person's life gets put under the microscope to ask, how can I make this more like God himself? How can I reflect my creator in every single aspect of my life? They're going to notice the flaws and the shortcomings. They're going to be able to see not just the beams in their own eyes, but the specks as they look into the mirror of God's word. They're going to recognize that I'm not there yet and diligently work to do that. Don't we sing a song to this effect? Purer in heart, O oh God, help me to be. I hope we don't sing that song thinking, well, I've got my purity for the day. Right? I'm as pure as I need to be. Purer in heart, that's for all the rest of you, right? No. Help me to be. Watch thou my wayward feet, guide me with counsel sweet. 
Does that describe my Monday morning or my Thursday afternoon? Does it describe my Saturday night pure in heart? Oh God, help me to be. Too often we spend our Saturdays doing things that we come to Sunday morning begging for forgiveness of. Pure in heart, help me to be. Let's try it on Saturday too. And Thursday, and Tuesday, and Monday, and today. The pure-hearted go about living these words because they're interested in seeing the glory of God. Not just enjoying the benefits of covenant relationship with Him. Heaven is special for exactly one reason. It is special because God is there. pure-hearted person realizes that's really what I want. They want to see the glory of God. I might have time for one more. We'll see. Back to Exodus 34. Now, after God makes his assurance, makes his uh, agreement with Moses that Moses, you, you'll hide down in the cleft of the rock. You'll be covered with, but we sing a song about that too, right? He hideth my soul in the cleft. That's from this passage. So after he makes his agreement with Moses and I'm going to hide you in the rock and I'll take away my hand. You'll see my back as I pass by, however that works. Notice that Moses is given something to do. Exodus 34 and verse one. Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words which were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning and come up to, in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No man's to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Sinai as God had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. Notice how Moses responds to God's instruction. If you went through the first couple of verses and just made a note, what are all the details of the thing God told Moses to do? He's told to cut out for himself two stone tablets, The stone tablets have to be like the first two, you know, the ones you broke at the bottom of the mountain. You know, kind of there's there's an admission or there's at least a comment as to that. He's told to be ready in the morning. If we're looking for scriptural, you know, support for worshiping on Sunday morning, here you have it, right? In the, no, that's not it, right? In the morning, come up to me on the mountain, present yourself. No one's to come with you nor are the flocks and herds supposed to be on the mountain. The pure of heart do what Moses did here, which is listen to what God had to say and then do that thing in exact fashion. If you follow this through the book of Exodus, no less than 14 times in the book of Exodus, there's the phrase, as the Lord had commanded Moses. That's what they did. As the Lord commanded Moses, as it's over and over and over, specifically at the end of the book when the tabernacle is being constructed. As the Lord commanded Moses. Pure-hearted people recognize that God is king and his word is law. Now, so far, if you're thinking about hard versus soft points that are made, the first three are kind of softish, right? You got what? They want to know more of God. That might be something that would be accepted in the general religious world. Yes, we all want to know more about God. Yes, we all want to continue without, we we all refuse to go anywhere unless God's happy with us. And yes, we desire to see God's glory. Those are all things you can hear in pulpits around the nation. What about the fourth one? It's just a scriptural. To say a pure-hearted person looks at what God has given us to do and says, I must do exactly this thing. Nowhere in this does Moses earn the right to be Israel's representative or earn by some kind of vicarious means the right for them to go to Canaan or in in some sense earn the right to see God's glory. None of that's here. But yet God says, do this thing, and Moses does that thing. In Matthew 5 and verse 19, Jesus described those who 
kept the commandments, and taught others to do the same as great in the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, it was the ones who relaxed even the least of these who are called least in the kingdom of heaven, right? That principle is biblical. It's godly. It's scriptural. The religious world leans toward a relationship over a religion, which in short is code for we don't emphasize following God's rules. We just claim the benefits of being in a relationship with God, right? We'll be near God and we'll, it's like being next to a heat lamp. We'll enjoy being warm, but we're not really supposed to do much. The way of God is the way of following his instructions. Am I diligent and am I careful to obey what God has said to do? In James chapter 1 and verse 23, if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he's looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Nothing gets changed. Nothing gets fixed. Nothing gets adjusted. Ladies, can we imagine putting on our makeup without a mirror? I cannot imagine. I, I'll be honest with you. I've never tried. But can you just imagine, right? You've got your bag of makeup things. And you begin doing the thing, but without a way to look at yourself? Maybe we should try that one day. That would be, that would be priceless. <laughs> what do you do? You look into the mirror, you see the imperfections, and then you go about you know, covering them up. The Word of God is the same. It's the person who, notice what James says, the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it. Not, becoming, or not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. The pure-hearted person looks intently at what God has said, even the difficult parts, the unpopular parts, the trigger-warning parts decides that this is what God has said and this is what I must do. They're more concerned with keeping God's law than they are the consequences of doing so. In whatever realm you want to think about it. Okay, one more. The pure of heart beg God for mercy. They beg Him for forgiveness and they beg Him to be adopted. I love how this passage continues in Exodus 33. Notice verse 6. When the Lord passes by in front of Moses, and we have here in this passage the beautiful uh, description God gives of himself as being compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Notice what Moses does in verse 8. Moses made haste. Now remember, Moses is quite an old man at this point. Moses made haste to bow low before the earth or toward the earth and worship. He said, And now if I found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate, and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your own possession. When Moses witnesses some small sliver of the glory of God, he is struck by the fact that he's not worthy to be there, nor are the Israelites worthy of such a God. And he doesn't just lackadaisically fall on his face. He hits the ground with his face. And he bows low before God. And he begins begging God for forgiveness and pardon and for them to take Israel and himself as their own possession. Have I done such a thing before our God? Have you? Throughout Scripture, those who were in those moments of purity of heart, they're often struck by this overwhelming need to be right before him, to be in his favor once again. Psalm 51 and verse 10, David begs God, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. I am not pure. I need to be pure. James would write in James 4 and verse 8, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Have you made haste to appeal to this God for forgiveness? We sing a song sometimes. Is thy heart right with God? Moses got to see a little bit of who God was, and the first thing he did was fall on his face and say, please forgive us. What I love about the white pages of Scripture is you read things that you've seen before in the yellow pages. In those more familiar sections of your Bible, we, find, we have those, those verses that have just been burned into our minds. And what we learn as we read the first three quarters of the Bible is that when I saw it in Matthew, when I saw it in Acts, when I saw it in Romans, it wasn't the first time. It's just the most recent time. Jesus told his listeners in Matthew 5 and verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Moses was the one who saw some version of the glory of God. He was pure of heart. This week, I'm not sharing any new doctrine with you. We're not here to rewrite the church or to come up with some grand scandalous thing based on the pages we don't read often. What I'd like to do is give you more reason to do what we find in the New Testament. To give you more motivation to be a part of the kingdom of Christ. To follow Jesus. To be Christian. To support your saints. To defend the truth. And I want to do that by looking at these men like Moses and Ezra and the psalmist and other people. Men and women have been seeking to be right with God for a long time before the New Testament was written. And seeing those lessons are helpful to us. We see them in their situation. Thank you for your time this morning. I look forward to, well, I would say look forward to meeting a lot of you, but you kind of have, right? Uh, looking forward to it. Thank you, guys.